I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Jeff Greenberg. Jeff is the CEO and managing member of Synergetic Synergetic Investment Group, LLC. Uh, For over 12 years, he has managed all aspects of commercial real estate ownership, including acquisitions, investor relations, operations, value-add implementation, and dispositions. Um, Jeff, I'm going to stop there because I, like I said, I want to definitely let you have the chance to tell your story. But first of all, let me just say thank you so much. Thank you for coming on the show today. Well, thank you, Jason. This is great. I'm excited to do this. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, t- tell people about your background. Tell us kind of how you got started in real estate. You know, give us give us your story. Well, my background essentially was in IT before I got into the real estate. But essentially, uh, going through a divorce, deciding that uh, some of my net worth was going to disappear, and uh, decided that uh, to look into real estate. And that was about 2007. Um, and we were looking at um, repossessed uh, houses, REOs, bank owned properties. But it wasn't a great time to do that because property values were going down quickly. And then uh, got into commercial real estate, realized that I could do commercial real estate, met a, a guru, and started to do uh, buying. Uh, commercial properties. I was learning about those in about 2008, but didn't really start until about 2010. And then for the past 12 years up to uh, 2022, um, essentially been buying commercial properties and student housing, which is just a little bit of a, a sub sub uh, set of multifamily. Sure. Sure. In your, so yeah, the, the timing of that, you know, 2007, getting into real estate right at 2007 was probably um, a very challenging time, maybe similar to what some of the things we're seeing now. Um, <clears throat> as you sort of grew through, you know, doing syndications, I mean, walk us through maybe the early days of that, you know, what what was your your process, kind of how did you grow? How did, how did that look for you over that time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the we had we had limited funds, uh, my partner and I, and we were, we learned how to use other people's money to help us get into the opportunities. And the first pr- property that we bought was actually five fourplexes. Uh, we treated it as a twenty-unit apartment, uh, but it was actually four freestanding uh, fourplexes, and we syndicated that. We raised money from uh, passive investors, had to raise $350,000, and, and that being our first time we'd ever raised money before, that was quite a challenge. Yeah. Uh, but we successfully did that. We ran that property for a while. This was a, a new property, though. It was actually uh, three years old at the time, but the challenge was was finding the value add, which was the big lesson is is making sure there is some value to add to a property. It was 100% occupied. Um, it was a new property. It, they were already paying for their electricity. And so we figured, okay, we're going to raise rents and we're going to charge for water. And that was fought. We had real difficulty doing that, getting people to come in at a higher rate and to take on uh, water. And so here we were with a property with very little value add. It was a great property, but we were unable to increase the value significantly. So it ended up being six years that we held that property to get enough value to give a good return for our investors. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you know, it's not necessarily a fun lesson while it's going on, but 
certainly that that's a, a great thing to kind of look at for people um, looking to get into syndication and, you know, sort of, I think, you know, value add tends to be maybe a um, very common uh, strategy, right? That's what, what everybody mm -hmm. thinks they're going to do value add. And there's different ways to add value, as you said, but sometimes when you're looking at a newer, you know, asset and, and you have to look at, you know, kind of what, where is the ability to add value there? And, and sometimes I think we just, people might just assume I'm going to add value just no, without actually you know, sort of formulating that plan ahead of time. And mm -hmm. you have to make sure that the market supports whatever you're going to try to do, whether that's like you said, raising rents, wh whether that's um, adding, you know, some sort of utility bill back or something. It's, all of that is um, it's great stuff to do. And those are value add components. It just has the, the property has to be able to support it. Well, people hear a lot about the value <laughs> add because we've been in a value add market for a while. Uh, but what people haven't heard much about is the momentum play. And a momentum play is more of just generic increases in rents, just gradual mm -hmm. over time, you're increasing in rents. You've got inflation, you've got in, you know, the increased you know, cost of uh, business. And so you uh, increase rents over time. So over time, you're still adding value to the property. It's just a much slower process. And that's not what we've been in before, but we're going back into that now. So uh, in the past, we were able to go in and turn a property in say three years. I've had some two and a half years, some three years where we've been able to get immense profits. Well, maybe now it's more of a time of, okay, we're going to hold on to this property for five years or seven years or even 10 years in order to get a significant profit on a property, because maybe there isn't a huge value add, but over time you're increasing in efficiencies and uh, increasing rents just on a as going uh, basis. And then you still can get some significant returns. It's just a longer process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. And, and it's, I guess it, it points to, uh, investing for whatever market cycle you're in, right? We were a year ago, we were in this sort of sort of tremendous growth or what everybody assumed tremendous growth. Um, it's unsustainable, can't can't go on forever, can't can't keep raising rents at, you know, uh 12 and 15 percent a year forever. It, it just people, there will be nobody to live in those units. Um, and so, you know, now we have to look at this phase of the market cycle. And what our strategy is going to be during this time. And as you said, maybe that means longer holds. Um, maybe that means a, you know, sort of managing your expectations for what those returns are going to be, especially in the short term. It, it's just a lot of um, sort of acknowledging and accepting what, what's going on right now. It doesn't mean that real estate's bad now. It just means it's a different strategy. Absolutely. And what you said, managing expectations is, is key. And that's something I've constantly, you know, talking with investors as far as, you know, the expectations for returns are going to be somewhat lower now. That doesn't mean we can't still get phenomenal returns, right. but it's going to be somewhat lower than we've had before. And it may take longer to do that. Um, this is a great opportunity uh, to get into the business, uh, but as long as you have realistic expectations and you have protections. Um, I talk a lot about what, what we're doing to protect the downside, because there is the possibility that we go into a recession. We, that may mean that uh, rents are gonna be flat. That may mean that rents are gonna go down. That may mean that uh, vacancies are going to go up. And we have to look at what are we doing to protect that? That's one. One of the first things I look at getting into a deal is how are we protecting the downside? Everybody's excited about the upside, but the key is let's look at what we're doing to protect the downside first. And if we like that, if that's working on the deal, then yeah, let's look at the exciting stuff, which is how much we can make money, you know, make for everybody. Right. Yeah. And no, that's a great point. It, it's it again, it just goes to that sort of uh, you, you should always be trying to, to focus on protecting that downside, but certainly 
um, that maybe has to be even a stronger focus right now, given that we're not going to be able to just sort of cover up any of those inefficiencies with uh, giant rent bumps. I mean, it's just it's not not likely to keep happening. Um, it's also, you know, very specific to market and asset class and all of that, all of that weighs in. And so th that's, that's an important, well, I think that's a good segue. I know, Jeff, now you're, you're sort of focused on um, the fund model. So maybe talk about why, why you made that transition, and then, you know, sort of what, what you're doing today with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, over the the period of time that I've been uh, doing the syndication, and I call myself a recovering syndicator, um, that I, you know, you always know what things you enjoy doing and, and what things that you're good at. And I've decided that uh, the operation end of it isn't what really excites me. Um, I would rather work with investors and educate investors and help investors understand the business and bring them in to opportunities. So what I've done now is created two different funds. And through those funds, I invest with operators that are of a high quality and that are bringing in deals that I feel are conservative and are protecting investors and are great opportunities. So I spend my time looking for good quality operators, as well as uh, bringing in new investors and helping them to understand the business. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's a great point about sort of realizing what your what your strengths are and what you enjoy, right? And, and hopefully those are the same thing. <laughs> Sometimes uh, people I think are, you know, we, we may have things that we're very good at it, but we don't necessarily enjoy it. Um, it's nice to have that overlap. But certainly that, you know, the joining that capital raising side of things and then finding, you know, sort of you're vetting those sponsors. So you're sort of pre-qualifying them for the investors that you're bringing in. So what do you, what do you do to kind of establish that? How do you decide, you know, what investors you are, sorry, which uh, sponsors you want to invest with, which operators, how are, what process are you using to, to vet them? Well, the thing is, is I, I mean, track record is one thing, but that, you know, track record is not the only thing, because obviously, as we've already discussed track, you know, a lot of people uh, threw a dart at the wall and they were able to, you know, have a great track record and do great performances. I want to see what they did as far as to get that track record, you know, uh, what were their, how'd they change their NOI? Did they uh, reduce their expenses? Um, was it just an increase in the, the rents or you know, did they add value? What other value did they add to their property? But the big thing is, is I wanna to get to know them. I wanna know what their business model is. I wanna know that they're full-time at it. I wanna know how long they've worked together. Um, I'm very picky about who I'll work with. And at this point, there's only a few operators that I'm working with. I am looking at a couple of other operators, but it takes me a while to get to know them personally, to know, you know what their team looks like, who's, who's got responsibilities on each of their team, you know, um, what responsibilities is, does everybody have on that team, and how long have they been doing that in that particular market or in that particular field. So it's a lot of digging into the business itself because this is a business yeah. and I want to know how long they've been operating it and to get to know them. You know, the, you know, I've, the people I've invested in, you know, so far have been people I've known for years and, you know, I'm in the middle of a raise right now, guys I've known for over three years. I've been in a mastermind with them and, you know, um, I've had dinner with them, had long talks with them. So it, I need to get them to know them as a person or as people and to know that uh, their ethics are in line, that they're, you know, protecting the investor and helping the investor out is key to the investment. And, you know, everything they do in the business is to add value to the business for the investor. Yeah. Yeah. It makes total sense. It's, 
it's so much about those relationships. You know, it, it sure on paper, no, no one's going to put a deal out there that doesn't look good. Right. So it's like, you, you've mm. got to, you know, no, no one's going to say this, you know, this one's going to be terrible. You're going to lose money. Like they're, they're all going to look good on paper. And so it's very, very much about that, you know, that connection, the, the, um, alignment of values. Um, yes, track record is, is in some ways important, but, um, as you said, in, in recent years, everybody's track record looked good because the market was so good. So it's just kind of like a, um, a whole picture and, and, you know, certainly getting to, getting to know those operators very, very well and what their processes and systems might be. Um, when you, are, are you still, uh, and you said you've, you've, um, worked in both multifamily and student housing. Is that kind of where you're focused now? Or are you looking at other asset classes as you're um, sort of running this fund model? How are you approaching that? Well, because I have a, a customizable fund, which gives investors the option to pick and choose which of the opportunities they want to be in, gives me the flexibility to go beyond just multifamily into other uh, investment opportunities that may bring bring different rewards. So some opportunities may bring in a higher cash flow, some may bring in a higher capital appreciation. Multifamily typically um, the cash flow isn't that high. It's typically better at appreciating your your capital, yeah. and so that's just one uh, opportunity. Um, we've we've uh, gone into short-term rentals, which is typically a higher cash flow and maybe not as much of a capital appreciation. Um, I'm also looking at some self-storage, mobile home parks. Uh, I know that um, there's a huge need for assisted living. So I'm talking to a couple of operators, possibly doing assisted living. Um, so there's all different things that I'm looking at that I may bring into, into the fund, but I need to find the experts in those fields before I'll uh, get involved with them. Uh, I've got a couple of people that are doing development and I'm kind of observing them and watching what they're doing now on the development side as well. So several, several different areas that I am looking at. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's, I think that's one of, people talk a lot about diversification. I think it's, it's, Probably when it comes to real estate, that's where you you probably want to look at your diversification is is within your within the funds or within a um, you know as an LP. When you're talking about being um, an active uh, operator, now that's where you really want to be very specific and and focused on whatever your niche is, market asset class, whatever that might be. And but you as this fund administrator, you're able to you know kind of offer your your investors best of all worlds in the sense that, as you said, you can, if they're looking for cash flow, here's, here's this opportunity. If you're looking for, you know, specifically appreciation or tax benefits, whatever the case may be, here's this other um, uh, deal to, to be involved in. So um, I think that it, it really is a great sort of merging um, where you're able to find, you know, really the right opportunities for, for your investors. Having been I really like to kind of ask this of people that that went through that sort of 2007, 2008, 2009 market in the Great Recession, and now seeing what's going on now, what are your thoughts as far as maybe what the, the near future holds, you know, six to 18 months? Before I answer that, the one thing I, I want to mention you because you mentioned about taxes and stuff mm -hmm. um the one of the the deals that we're in is a, a bitcoin mining fund mm -hmm. um which of course bitcoin of course decided to go down as soon as we we opened that one up but i just uh received uh, the k1 for the bitcoin mining fund which was uh, a purchase of of a lot of equipment we just got about a 90 98 percent depreciation on our k1 so about 98% of what money was put into the fund is able to be written off for this year. So that's another thing besides cash flow and capital appreciation is the tax benefits of some of these opportunities. Yeah. Um, now to your question, as far as what I see up and coming, I see 
a lot of opportunities coming. This is actually a phenomenal time to be getting into the business if you know what you're doing. Uh, there are a lot of deals that are under stress um, because of the, the variable interest rate. Right now, I won't go into a deal uh, unless it's a fixed, a fixed rate. Currently, I'm, we're working on a deal that has a fixed rate that's uh, a 3.8 uh, interest, uh, interest only for the next seven years. And uh, it's a low leverage. So I'm looking for low leverage loans. This one's 60% uh, leveraged. And so there are people that maybe bought a rate cap, but the rate cap is coming due and they're gonna have to buy a new rate cap or they're gonna need to uh, refinance. And refinancing may not be a great option for them because of the rates right now. So they're getting into trouble. I do know someone that had a rate cap for the first three years. They were escrowing for years four and five. And the escrow was at 9,000 a month. It went to 54,000 a month. Now it's at $74,000 a month to escrow. That's just putting money away for a rate cap for years four and five. And that is certainly going to put a damper on your, your distributions and your cash flow. And uh, if any of your listeners, listeners don't understand what a rate cap is, essentially it's an insurance policy to uh, guarantee that your interest rate doesn't go up. You know, if it goes up a certain amount, this rate cap will, will pay the difference, usually an ex, another point. Uh, it will pay that extra amount uh, that the interest rate has gone up. So uh, essentially an insurance policy. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, <laughs> I can tell you, I'm quite thankful we have a rate cap on our our one uh, adjustable rate deal. Um, well, there's has... others that, there's other people I know that don't have a rate cap. Yeah, I know. I'm and they're, a lot they're, of those they're scrambling. Yeah, yeah, it is, uh, scrambling. It is and so the problem. <laughs> That's so that's going to be opportunity for those people that are, are standing, you know, looking over and finding deals. The deal that I'm raising for right now, the the sponsor of the deal, the guy running the deal, he's in distress, not because of the particular properties that we're buying from him, but his other properties, he needs liquidity. So he has mm -hmm. to sell this property. So we're getting a great deal on this property because he needs to sell it quick to go and help his other properties. So there's all kinds of distress, different, different ways uh, in this market. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. It doesn't, you know, it's not, there's many different ways for the distress to present itself and, you know, just being open and, and aware and ready for those opportunities when they come up is going to be the key. I, you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to see what we saw in 2008. Um, but I think that, you know, there's certainly going to be some stuff, you know, a, a lot of it having to do with the timing of those rate caps. And as, as you mentioned, I think I, I think we know the same person because I know that story about the, the rate cap um, reserve being so much increased. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging time. Uh, a lot of people are going to, you know, sort of learn some, learn some lessons here. Um, but it, it, it will also, you know, the people that sort of make it through, it's, it's either because they are already, you know, sort of operating at that, at the, you know, sort of at a very smart conservative way, or you're going to learn to operate at a smart conservative way. And they're, they've got a little bit away from the fundamentals probably in the, in the years prior. But again, it's, I think it's just, you know, being um, aware of what's going on in the market cycle around you. <clears throat> Um, Jeff, I want to I want to switch gears. I want to get to ask you the questions that I ask every guest. Uh, and the first one is, of course, the name of the show is Know Your Why. So I always ask every guest, "What's your why? What what drives you? What you know? You've obviously had a lot of success. What kind of keeps you going towards more and more?" Well, I mean, initially the the why was uh, to retire, and uh, just uh, this weekend I celebrated my seventh year out of my W two yet my w-2 job uh, but also it's leaving leaving a legacy uh for my family my 
I've got uh, grandkids and kids, and uh, I'd like to leave something to them, but I also want to educate them and show them what can be done in real estate. So I'm trying to lead by example and showing, you know, what they can do, um, you know, to improve their lives. But I'm, I'm buying myself time as well. Um, being in this business, you know, my time is, is my time. I can schedule things around my time and do what I want around my schedule. You know, so it's nobody's telling me what I can and can't do. So it's a great business for that. Yeah. The uh, the beauty of time freedom. Uh, it's uh, something Absolutely. that, you know, sort of, I think basically everyone in this business is really that's kind of the end goal. Um, next question for you, Jeff. What What is something about yourselves that yourself that is isn't common knowledge, something to let people know you a little better, a special skill, a hobby, um, anything that you're uh, open to sharing? Well, uh, I, I bike every other day, about, uh, about 30 miles. I road bike. I used to teach scuba diving, um, quite a few years ago. Um, I like to go, I still like to go skiing too, but I, I guess number one is spending time with my grandkids. That's probably, uh, my number one hobby. Oh, and, oh, I guess I, I just, I just built a sauna the other day uh, right. a couple months ago and so i have a wood burning sauna on my in my backyard that i built it's perfect for after those bike rides nice <laughs> relaxing after sauna. the bike rides i i got the sauna and i've also got the hot tub there so go. i go from there the go. i go from the 180 degree sauna into the 100 degree hot tub and maybe even into the 60 degree pool yeah i was like but, and then a cold uh, plunge you got yeah the, well, the pool the right 60 degree that. pool is good enough good enough yeah. cold plunge and yeah. then back into the 180 degree sauna yeah for a couple yeah. more rounds we um <laughs> my uh, a good friend of mine from from home uh he I, I don't know his his dad like when they were we were teenagers they, they had a had a sauna at their house and this is in massachusetts so it would be uh we would go in the sauna and then go out and dive in a snowbank and like the mm. the uh the shock in the change in temperature there is like very <laughs> very uh shocking but also like exhilarating at the same time it's kind of a kind of a neat thing to do so yeah i was always enjoyed that um when people hear this and they want to reach out to you what's the best way well they could get a hold of me at jeff at synergetic ig.com and you can see synergetic behind me but at s y n e r g e t i c i g dot com and then i i have a a book um questions to ask deal sponsors before you invest with them. Um, if they go to sigcre.com slash sponsor, they can get the free ebook with questions about uh, the questions to ask a deal sponsor if you wanted to invest passively. If you're an active investor, it's, a, it's good questions to be aware of and think about. Mm -hmm. So you can answer those questions if you're asked. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think a lot of those, um, <laughs> a lot of those books about, you know, whether it's eBooks or um, like Brian Marty's book, but but just things about um, questions that you should ask as a as a limited partner. It's really a good idea for for active operators, sponsors to to kind of read those books as well to get the idea of what um, what you should be prepared to answer. And we'll put all of that um, in the show notes as well. Um, but the final question for you, Jeff, what, what's something, what's a piece of advice you would give to someone who is getting started in real estate um, to kind of get them, get them going, get them on their way? Yeah, um, I'm always asked about, you know, people doing, uh, getting mentors and uh, people to help them on their way. And typically what I tell people is, is if you could find somebody that's doing what you want to do and then find a way to add value to them to be some kind of resource. Uh, it may be if, if you're living in an area that you could be boots on the ground or maybe you're able to fly out and do due diligence on a property for them. Uh, maybe it's making phone calls. Maybe it's building relationships. Maybe you know people with money. Maybe you're bringing money in. Um, People in this business are busy and any way that you can help them by buying them time 
Uh, if you have time, that's extremely valuable for somebody in the business. But being alongside of or working with somebody that's you know several steps ahead of you is is the best way to get involved. But before you do that, you got to do some work on your own, which is educating yourself. And there's a lot of great books out there. There's great podcasts, but get yourself educated in the business so you can increase your value to, to somebody else and help them with their business. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely great advice. And I think, um, you know, kind of that, uh, a lot of times when people say they're looking into mentorship, there are a lot of paid programs. There are a lot of options as far as that goes. Uh, but also, you know, kind of looking at it from that apprenticeship type model that you spoke, just finding someone that's doing what you're doing and, and be there to, to add them value. You, you'll move, you'll learn so much just being around that person. So um, it's a great piece. But of even, advice. even, even, even in the, even in the, the paid mentorships, you, you know, they're not going to infuse it into your body. Right. Um, you've got to do the work. Yeah. And, and if you go in and, and, and read a couple books, Brian Burke has a great book, the hands-off investor. Um, uh, James Kanasanmi has a book on investing. Um, read some of those books. And so you have a basis. So when you, if you go to a seminar or if you have, you get a mentor, you've already moved yourself up the ladder where you can absorb a lot more. If you come into either an apprenticeship type of thing or a mentorship type of thing, and you're totally at ground zero, you're not going to gain nearly as much as if you're a few steps up that you've already done something for yourself. So you've got to do something for yourself first, get yourself started, get the education process moving along. Then when you learn from these other people, you're, you're already at a, at a higher level. Absolutely. It, it's true. It, I mean, there's, there's honestly no point, especially for the, you know, those paid mentorships, there's no point in paying the money if you're not going to do the work. Otherwise you're just kind of throwing it away. So you've, you've got to, as you said, they're not going to infuse it into you. It, it's, you get into it, what you, or get out of it, what you put into it. So um, really, really great point there. Um, well, listen, Jeff, this is great. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing your story. Um, I, I really uh, enjoyed our conversation. And, and again, thank you for taking the time out. Hey, thank you for having me. This was fun. Yeah. And uh, folks listening, uh, please like, rate, and review. It helps us get more great guests like Jeff. Um, to all, have a great day. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.